here at Lake Viking to have young men and young women who are willing to do what it takes for us to maintain the freedom in which that God has given us. Amen. 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 We say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You know, we take these words for granted too often, but whenever that you pledge your allegiance to something, you are pledging your life, you are pledging your wealth, your health. Everything that you have needs to be devoted to that. There were men and women who did that very thing to the flag and to the United States of America and to the Republic. Note there it says Republic. We are not a democracy in the way that some people may think, but we are a Republic in which that we have representatives who go to Congress for us to be able to speak on our behalf. One nation under God indivisible, unable to be broken, with liberty and justice for all. What a pledge. This pledge actually through the years has developed into what it is from what it originally started out to be. But we not only have the pledge to the allegiance of the flag, but we also have the pledge to the allegiance to the Bible which says, I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, and I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, and I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. You see, the thing is, is we need to devote ourselves to these things in which that we say we pledge ourselves to. We also have a pledge to the Christian flag which says, I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. Amen. These are principles in which that we should stand for and that we need to take counsel of and not just overlook them as though they are idle words. Because for the men and women of our past who had pledged their lives and their loves and their fortunes, it was more than just simply words that were on a page or words that we quoted. It was a lifestyle in which they knew when they put their devotion and their pledge towards this, it could very well cost them everything they had. I'll make mention of this this morning. We are a Bible-believing church, and as if we believe the Bible, we are saved by the grace of God through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. We believe that. There is nothing that you can do on your own to obtain salvation except receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But I want you to know that discipleship, now hear me out, discipleship may cost you literally everything that you have. That's what Jesus told us. As disciples, we may have to give a few things up if we are truly His. As we celebrate the 4th of July this year, it's in the middle of the week. And you know, as I thought and prayed about it, you know, we're probably going to celebrate the 4th of July next weekend too. Praise God. Amen. But as I begin to pray and as I begin to think more about this, I thought we need to celebrate that this weekend coming into the 4th of July, which is on Thursday, because you know what? After the 4th, it's over. It's gone. It's done. So you need to have your hearts and minds ready to be able to receive what God has 
for us so that the 4th of July will have more meaning to it. Amen. Because it is not something that is just within history. It was life lived by those who were willing to dedicate and devote everything that they had. Such as those that were the signers of the Declaration of Independence. There were 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. Have you ever wondered what happened to the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence? When they signed that paper, they were signing their life away. Five signers were captured by the British as terrorists and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons serving in the Revolutionary War or Army. Another uh, had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds or hardships of the Revolutionary War. Think about that. These men believed in what they were doing to such a degree that they literally put their lives on the line and they fought for what they believed. They signed and they pledged their lives and their futures, their fortunes, and their uh, sacred honor. They were willing to give it all as soon as they signed the Declaration of Independence in which we hold high, they were ultimately signing their death warrants. What kind of men were they? Twenty-four were lawyers and justices. Now think about that. 24 of the signers of the Declaration of Independence was lawyers and justices. 11 were merchants, 9 were farmers and large plantation owners, men of means, well um, educated. But they signed the Declaration of Independence knowing full well that the um, penalty would be death if they were captured. How many people today would be willing to put their lives and their families' lives on the line knowing when they did this that they were going to die and many of them gruesome deaths? Carter Baxton of Virginia, a wealthy plantation or a planter and a trader, saw his ships swept from the seas by the British Navy. And he sold his home and uh, properties to pay his debts and died in rags. This was a wealthy man at one time, but because he put his name, he put his signature, he put his life on that, it cost him everything he had. Thomas McKean was so haunted by the British that he was forced to move his family almost continually. He served in the Congress without pay, and his family was kept in hiding. His possessions were taken from him, and uh, poverty was his reward. Wow, poverty was his reward. Vandals and soldiers looted the properties of Dillery, Paul, Clay, Walton, Gritton, Hayward, Rutledge, and Middleton. As the Battle of Yorktown, Thomas Nelson Jr. noted that the British general, Caldwash Cornwallis, had taken over the Nelson home for his headquarters. He quietly urged General George Washington to open fire, and the home was destroyed, and Nelson died bankrupt. Francis Lewis had his home and properties destroyed. The enemy jailed his wife, and she died with him, or died within a few months. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled from their lives, fled for their lives. His fields and his uh, gristmill was laid to waste. 
For more than a year, he lived in forests and caves, returning home to find his wife died and his children banished. So, take a few moments while enjoying your 4th of July holiday and silently thank these patriots. It's not much to ask for the price they paid. Freedom is not or never free. Where do you stand in your convictions with Christ? After reading this here, think about this. Are you willing to give up? Some of our young men and women here in this congregation were willing to say, send me. I'll go. And we can be thankful for that. But we need to support them in their efforts of where they are right now to give them the strength and the encouragement that they need to be able to stand when all that they maybe can, just like Dakota's letter said, you know, sometimes you feel like you're steel, but you look back and you want to fall down. As a nation, there is a cycle of 200 years cycle of democracy. Alexander Tite Titler was a historian at the University of Edinburgh, and he is a uh, and he, he is attributed with claiming in 1787 that the average lifespan of a democracy is 200 years. He remarked that a democracy is always temporary in nature. It simply cannot exist as a permanent form of government. And, pursue, um, and pursuant to his observation of Athens and Rome, he recognized that the following cycle, which he posted all democracies follow. One, from bondage to spiritual faith. From spiritual faith to great courage. From great courage to liberty. And from liberty to abundance. And from abundance to complacency. And from complacency to apathy. And from apathy to dependence. And from dependence back to bondage. Where do you think we as a nation are at in that cycle? We need to stand for the truth. You see, I don't just simply serve this country. There is another country in which I serve. Amen. Another place, another kingdom in which that I am proclaiming and telling you that God has prepared for us that will be eternal and that will be through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Because He's coming back. He's coming to return to take His people. Amen? Now I believe that. There are a lot of those today who do not believe that Christ is returning. They don't believe that there is a hereafter. Let's eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. But I want you to know that life continues on past this fleshly body into the eternal. And we need to be ready. The Apostles' Creed says this, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, <coughs> suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. The third day, He rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. Somebody ought to be getting excited besides me. Man, <laughs> this sounds like Easter. <clears throat> and said it at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. The quick, the living, and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, and the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Now, I, prop, I always feel necessary to repeat in this here to where this is the Apostles' Creed. Whenever that it says the Holy Catholic Church, they are not talking about the Roman Catholic Church. They are talking about the church united as the body of Christ. So please make no mistake in that. But when you look and you see some of these creeds and some of these pledges in which that we as Christian believers have had to make in the past, it should cause our hearts to be stirred today to want to do more for the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God is at hand. I sometimes tell people I pray even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Because I'm telling you, as the world is in a state of disarray, we in the body of Christ don't need to be concerned about the things of tomorrow. Our hope needs to be in God. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Matthew in chapter 25. You see, because Jesus, actually, I'm starting a series today, and the title of that series is Gifts, Talents, and Abilities. But I felt that it was so important today as if we celebrate the 4th of July or as we are entering into that stage of this week and there will be a lot of celebrations. We need to know that there was a price that was paid by men and women who gave their lives when they simply signed on the dotted line. Here is your death warrant. And today we have no understanding of what it was like for them knowing that what they were signing they believed in, but the people that it would affect in the future is still affecting us today. We need to stand up for what the truth is of the Word of God, but we need to stand up for what the truth of the men and women who laid down their lives for us to have the freedom. Do you know in many countries if people preach the way that I preach, the government's coming in and they're taking me. Amen? But you see, we have the freedoms here to be able to speak clearly. Amen? One of the things that I heard on Christian radio today was a woman and she was saying, well, I heard it the other day too, you know, you get a couple of series in there. But this woman had said that, you know, she had lived a life of sexual obscurity or of sexual immoralities. And as if she did, you know, she never thought about the things of God and she just lived and she was having abortions and she was having this go on. But she went to work for a company that this company, or she wanted to go to work for this company and wanted to see if that she would be paid under the table. And they said, no, we can't do that. We're a reputable company. And whenever it finally came down, they said, you, you can't work for us because the lifestyle in which that you live is not acceptable. And she said... Who's it not acceptable to? And these men said, it's not acceptable to God. Okay? She said at that moment, she had never really thought about God. But when confronted with that, that your lifestyle is not pleasing to God, or it's not pleasing, well, who's it not pleasing to? That should bring some conviction to our hearts here today because is your lifestyle pleasing to God or not? Amen. It either is or it isn't. Amen. And if God says it's wrong, it's wrong. Amen. I don't care how you want to try to justify it, it doesn't make it right. It is still God's law and it is still God's ways in which that we need to listen and adhere to. In Matthew in chapter 25 and starting in verse 14 it says, For the kingdom of heaven... Now that's the kingdom that I am pressing towards. That's the mark of the high calling that we have in Christ Jesus. That's the kingdom that I want to be in. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who's um, called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. He said, look guys, I'm going to go on a trip. And as I go on this trip, I'm going to give 
give to you my goods. I'm going to give to you what I have that needs taken care of. And unto one he gave five talents, and to another two talents, and to another one, another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway he took his journey. Now take note, there was one that was given five talents, there was one that was given two here, and then but the other one was given one. Verse 16, And then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had, had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged and the earth in the earth and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of this ser of those servants came cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained besides them five talents more. The Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Woo, that's where I want to be. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Do you know whenever that I do a funeral service, it is such a joy for me to be able to say when I know the people that they have served God, they have done well with what they have done, and I can just hear the Lord say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over much. Man, that's got to be such a joy. I can't wait for the Lord to tell me that. I sure hope He tells me that. You know, I may get a few swats as well along the way. I don't know. I'm trying to keep from that. But that should be each and every one of our heart's desires is that whenever that it comes to that point that we leave from this plane and we enter into the eternal and where there's no turning back, that the Lord could say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done. And then you know, as we see the next servant here in verse 22, and he also had received... He that also had received the two talents came and said, Lord, thou delivered unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two more talents besides them. He said, and the Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into my joy of my thy Lord. I want to tell you something. The only way that the Lord is going to tell you well done, good and faithful servant, is if you have been well done. If you're not living the way that you need to be living, and you expect God to tell you this when you enter in, you're fooling yourself. I'm just making it real plain. I don't think we've ever had a problem with this preacher telling you the way you needed to be told. Because we need to be living for God and not living for ourselves and for our selfish motives. Now, if I'm stepping on somebody's toes this morning, I'm just simply going to say, praise God. Because I don't want you to miss the mark of where we're headed in heaven. Verse 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I know thee that thou art a hard man reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid my talent in the earth, and lo, there thou hast that I is not. And the Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sow not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the ex exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury or interest. Take therefore that talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath 
shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, where or there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow, that's not very popular. That's not politically correct. But that's what the Bible says. That's what the Scriptures in red letter, the words of Jesus, tell us. Okay? These men and women who put their lives on the line that we could have the freedom in which we enjoy today cost them to the place of blood and body. We need to take seriously our faith in Christ because each and every one of us have been given different gifts and different talents to be used not for our own selfishness, but for the kingdom of God's sake. Amen? Amen? How many of you were here Wednesday night? We had Scott's trainer that was here from the Taekwondo, and he gave us a demonstration and he gave us a lesson on, what did you call it, Scott? Self-defense, personal self-defense. You know, these individuals have a way of using the strength that they have to be able to protect the weak. Because there are weak that need to be protected, and we which are strong need to uphold them. Amen? This church is a church that is set up on a hill that we might be a light to the community in which when we step outside of these doors and people are like, why are you so different? And, you know, I know Jesus. That's the first thing. Amen. Amen. Why are you so happy all the time? You know, we just know Jesus, don't we, Norm? Amen. We just know Jesus. But ultimately, we have an opportunity to be able to share with them. We go to a church to where the truth is preached and to where it's expected in our lifestyles. Amen? Amen. And the lifestyle that we live is in such a way that shows forth godliness. But the talents that you have need to be harvested. They need to be reaped in such a way. They need to be kind of worked around to where that they grow and they mature in our lives because God didn't give it to us just so we could go bury it in a hole. He gave it to us so that we might go out and preach the kingdom of God. See, whether you like it or not, every one of us has been given the ministry of reconciliation. You may not be called to be the preacher behind the pulpit, most people say, Woohoo, praise God, hallelujah. I don't want to fight that guy. Mm -hmm. But you have been given the ministry of reconciliation to share your faith, to bring people to an understanding that they can be reconciled or made right with God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The women's ministry that we now have, and we had 20 some women out there at the truck stop. You know what? I'm sure somebody noticed when they came in. What's all these women doing? Is this a, some type of women's group or what is it? Well, that, that's the women that gather once a month to share their faith and just to encourage one another in Christ. Amen. The men's breakfast that we're going to have next week, it's our church's turn to be able to um, host it. Yes, to be able to host this event. Guess what? I look forward every month to see the different men from the different churches that gather together. And it's not all one denomination. It's a lot of different denominations. But we join together in our faith because we encourage one another in Christ. And you see, God gave us gifts and God gave us talents so that we might be able to allow those to grow. But what are you... Uh-oh. What are you... What are you doing personally? That's right. I'm messing. I'm messing this morning. I'm sorry. I'm messing. Amen. I'm messing. What are you doing personally in your efforts of the gifts and talents that God has given you? Are you showing mercy to those who need to get mercy? That may be someone who you really don't want to give mercy to, but God wants you to show His mercy and His grace. Amen. Are you doing that or are you simply stepping back and letting your talent and your ability... I'm not going to talk to that person. Mm, they're mean. They're nasty. Mm, they can be harsh. I've talked to people like that before. You know what? The more you love them, the easier it gets. Amen. Just think, I'm throwing hot coals underneath there. Amen. But it's for the glory of God. You need to understand that what God has 
gifted you with. And if you're having trouble in that area of being compassionate towards somebody, allow God to work with you in that area to make you more compassionate to where that you can give. Because if you don't have it, you can't give it. Johnny, could, could, you, could you give this book to this gentleman right here? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Come right over here. Yeah, you go ahead. You give him that. You give him that book. No, 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 not that one. That book's no good. That book's no good. It's got to be this book. The point. The point is. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, the point is, if you don't have it, you can't give it. Amen. It's the same thing spiritually. If you don't have it, you can't give it. And if you can't give it, he can't get it. So you need to be able to have that mercy. You need to be able to have the compassion that you can weep with those that weep. You can mourn with those that mourn. It's easy to rejoice with those that rejoice. Amen? But try weeping with somebody whenever they need to weep. You know what? Sometimes there are no words that can ever be said or no amount of wisdom would be able to fly out of your mouth that would do what needs to be done in that time of grief and sorrow. Sometimes all you can do is just love them and just be there. And that's enough. That's enough. But you've got to be willing to allow God's gifting through you to spread roots, to grow and to mature. This is the only the beginning of this series because gifts, talents, and abilities is what we're going to be talking about within the next couple of weeks. Some of the things that we have are natural giftings in which God gave us, but there are also the side of the spiritual giftings that God gives for the edifying, for the building up of the body until we all come into unity, into one place in Christ. So as you think about these things, as we come on to the 4th of July and we celebrate the glory, we celebrate the colors. Oh glory, I should have said oh glory, shouldn't I care? Think about what it actually costs others that we might have this freedom. Amen. Johnny, if you come and lead us in song, let us celebrate this morning in what those that paid the price, we reap the benefits. Brother John. Stand with me if you will.